Hey guys, good morning. I, I'm, a, I'm excited to be with you, even if it's this way. I was hoping to be with you in person. American Airlines had some different ideas, and my private plane is in the shop because of supply chain disruptions. So um, I don't have a private plane, by the way. But anyway, thank you. Look, there's no shortage of conferences, but this is one I really wanted to be a part of. Because this conference isn't just about preaching to the choir. The thing I really like about this conference is it's about thinking and about listening and about learning. And ultimately, it's about defining what it means to be a conservative in the 21st century. Because yesterday's over and it's never going to return. So now I think our challenge is we have to take the eternal principles and the lessons of the past and apply them to the challenges of the present to chart the right course for our country and for its future. So hopefully later today, but if not at some point tomorrow, I'll be traveling to Washington, D.C., where a city where Democrats hold power by literally the slimmest of margins. But they govern as if they've been given this broad mandate for, for radical change. And I think it's telling that the agenda promoted by candidate Joe Biden is very different from the one that's being pushed by a president, Joe Biden. Candidate Joe Biden, for example, promised a return of competency and professionalism. Uh, President Joe Biden's been delivered chaos and incompetence. We have a historic calamity on our southern border, a humiliating and deadly debacle in Afghanistan, stranded cargo ships off the coast of California, and the skyrocketing price of, of literally everything. You know, candidate Joe Biden promised to unify a bitterly divided country. President Joe Biden has been an enthusiastic agent of division and polarization, pitting Americans against each other, not just on race and progress but now uh, by, by vaccination status, too. And candidate Joe Biden, he promised to build the country back better. But President Joe Biden has staked his presidency, his legacy, on a plan to build back socialists, a federal takeover of child care and pre-K, a cadre of government-funded climate enforcers, and an army of new tax collectors to make sure that no potential tax dollars are left behind. Now, there's a reason why candidate Joe Biden did not campaign on the agenda of President Joe Biden. And the reason is that the overwhelming majority of Americans think that that agenda is crazy. These tactics and this agenda do not reflect the broad will of Americans. They reflect the long-held fantasies of a small and radical but powerful few. According to a recent study, it's the agenda of about 8% of the country. The 8% who believe America is a systemically racist country with a shameful history and an oppressive free enterprise capitalist economy. The problem is they have power beyond their numbers because they happen to be the people who run our schools and our universities, our tech companies, our large corporations, the media, sports, the entertainment industry. They're the most generous donors and enthusiastic activists in one of our two major political parties. And look, while the tactics that they're using may be new to most Americans, they bring back really painful memories to the refugees and the exiles that I was raised by and that I still live around. First, you divide the people against each other, good versus evil, victim versus oppressor, and then you promise to deliver equity and justice. The second thing you do is you make everything political, sports, art, culture, everything becomes a tool to promote and impose that agenda. And finally, anyone who dares to oppose your agenda, they're persecuted, they're censored, they're punished into silence or driven out uh, to make an example of them. For over a century, by the way, these are the tactics used by Marxists to take over countless nations and societies all over the world. And now, these are the tactics being used to take over and destroy our country. It's why our schools have been turned into indoctrination centers, where children that are not even yet old enough to dress themselves are taught that the color of their skin automatically makes them either victims or oppressors. It's why sports and movies and even a virus that came from China have been politicized. It's why speakers are uninvited from college campuses, why authors have their books removed by Amazon and comedians are targeted for destruction. It's why the Attorney General of the United States recommended that parents who complain about our public schools be reported as domestic terrorists to the FBI. There, there are two lessons we should remember about Marxism. The first, is that any time it appears, there are always some who think that they can protect themselves from its wrath by cooperating with Marxism. That's why right now, big business is all in. We have major American corporations that boycott states that pass laws which aren't woke. By the way, the same corporations have no problem sending our jobs to a China ruled by a genocidal government. It's why we have tech companies who become enforcers, censoring views they don't like and silencing those who dare to speak out. But eventually, 
they all learn that for the Marxist, there can be no organization or institution independent of the movement. Everyone, all, must serve the revolution. And the second lesson of Marxism is that the promise of equity and justice, or whatever catchphrases they come up with, they're all very popular until people figure out what it really means. Until you see it means giving up the right to decide what is best for your children. Until you see it means celebrating rioting and looting and releasing dangerous criminals from jail at the same time as you're going to defund police. Until you realize that eventually they start running out of systemic oppressors to go after. And then they come after you. Then people turn against it. Then they realize the monster they've created and invited into their home. But far too often by then it is too late. Well, it's still not too late for us, but we are running out of time. We are confronted not by a transitory political movement. We're confronted by a systemic effort to dismantle our culture, our society, our traditions, our economy, and our way of life. And the only way to defeat it is to speak clearly about what is true and to protect what is good about and fix what is broken in 21st century America. Now here's why I tell you that those who believe the answer lies simply in traditional Wall Street Journal conservatism are making a very dangerous mistake. Rapid technological changes, globalization, market concentration, that's all led to a 21st century economy that has left millions of hardworking patriotic Americans feeling like they're locked out from the promise of our country. Promising to just cut more regulations and corporate taxes, that, that's going to get applause from campaign donors and get some glowing coverage in media outlets that are focused on the stock market. But it leaves millions of hardworking Americans, people who do not want woke socialists and woke socialist America. It leaves them with no voice in our politics and no answers to their problems. Americans are looking for, and America needs, a conservative movement that defends individual liberty, protects our culture and values, and promotes capitalism. But it must be a capitalism that creates jobs, American jobs, that allow Americans to get married, own a home, raise a family in a safe neighborhood, retire with dignity, and leave their children better off than themselves. Our country does not need, and Americans are not interested in a capitalism that means we are here to do what is best for the market. What we need is a common good capitalism in which the market is here to serve us, to serve our country, and our national interest and our people. Now, look, that doesn't mean record days for Wall Street and grain earning reports are a bad thing. But if those record days on Wall Street and earnings are the result of sending jobs to and importing more from China, well, that's probably very good for the corporations. But that isn't good for America or Americans. For many decades, by the way, this wasn't an issue. What was good for corporate America and good for our country was usually the same thing. When Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan threatened us, our companies harnessed the power of industry to defeat them. After the war, much of the world was rebuilding, and American companies used American workers to invent, make, and sell their products here and to the rest of the world. For decades, as Charles Wilson once famously said, what was good for our country was good for General Motors and vice versa. But the world changed, and so did the economy. The economies of Europe and Asia recovered. And they became our competitors. Cheaper labor overseas led American companies to send jobs overseas because it lowered costs and helped increase profits. And most dangerous of all, the Chinese Communist Party figured out, figured out a way to use our own corporations against us, inviting them in as partners, stealing their know-how and secrets, turning them into lobbyists in Washington on their behalf of their agenda, and then ultimately, though, standing up their own companies to replace them. And something else changed, too. Today, many of our most important corporations are run by people who consider themselves not citizens of America. They consider themselves citizens of the world. They are the product of decades of anti-American indoctrination at our elite universities, and they feel no obligation to America or to our national interests. I'm not here to tell you big business is the enemy, but I'm here to tell you big business is not our ally in the fight against socialism. Yes, they come running for help to conservatives when the left threatens to raise their taxes. They come running for help when workers decide they want to unionize. But on most days, they're eager culture warriors who have mastered the art of wrapping wokeness in the language of free market capitalism. 
So that they try to pay their workers as little as possible and charge consumers as much as they can get away with. But when they invest in the latest gender fad or climate initiative, they say it's because that's what their workers and customers demand. Allowing this new version of shareholder primacy to define capitalism would be to accept an elaborate justification for letting Wall Street and woke corporations run our economy and control our lives. Reviving America's corporate patriotism. That's what we need to be focused on. The left is using the tools of government to require companies to disclose their progress on racial quotas, on the Green New Deal. The answer isn't to use government to force companies to be patriotic. The answer is to pass laws that incentivize corporate actions that are good for America and are good for Americans. First, that means getting wokeness out of the boardroom, at a minimum. We should require that companies be subject to strict scrutiny and to legal liability when they abuse their corporate privilege by pushing wasteful, anti-American nonsense. Right now, the burden is on the shareholder to prove that those woke stances, like boycotting a state for having the audacity of passing an election law, shareholder has to prove that those are bad for shareholders. Burden's on them. Instead, the burden should be on the company to prove that it's acting in the best interest of shareholders. Second, that means that we need a stock market that holds companies accountable for pro-American goals rather than left-wing social engineering or globalist profiteering. We should require that companies disclose to investors and to be held to account. Instead of requirements that companies' board of directors be sufficiently diverse, like what the Biden administration is demanding, we should have requirements that companies' board of directors be free of any conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest involving, for example, adversaries like China. Similarly, instead of disclosing how compliant they are with a radical left environmental agenda, let's have companies tell the public how much they're investing in hiring and training American workers, how many factories or facilities they're opening in America, and disclosing, by the way, when they decide to send an American job or American factories to another country. To better align what the stock market rewards with what is good for America, we also need to break institutional finances control over corporate America. We should stop using American retirement dollars to help fund China's ambitions. Today, the retirement fund for federal employees, that includes members of our military, that retirement fund is investing in Chinese companies. That includes companies developing weapons to kill our men and women in uniform. I have a proposal that bans our federal retirement program from continuing to do this. We should pass it immediately. But the biggest challenge is how to address the big institutional shareholders who use the billions of dollars of American worker investments. They control these dollars and they use it to push corporations to adopt woke and anti-American policies. Maybe the time has come to require that these institutional shareholders get the votes of their clients rather than vote on their behalf. There'd be a lot less craziness in American corporations if the people voting their shares were actually firefighters and police officers instead of union bosses or Wall Street financiers. Let me conclude by just saying this. Not long ago, our politics were defined by a choice between conservatives and liberals, or between more government and less government, or higher taxes or less taxes. That used to define our politics. Not anymore. The dividing line in our politics now is between insanity and normal, between looniness, lunacy, and common sense. Amer look, Americans who don't identify as the gender they were born with, they deserve courtesy and respect and equality under the law. But it is insanity to force the overwhelming majority of Americans to adopt changes to the English language or accept the disruption in our schools to accommodate the demands of a minuscule minority. Our nation's past isn't perfect and our present is not without challenges, but our history is better than anyone else's. And despite our problems, tens of millions of people would come here in a heartbeat if given the chance. It is crazy that our children are being taught that their country's history is one to be ashamed of and that their country today remains a systemically racist one. And the rapid transformation has left many locked out of achieving the American dream. And that has to be addressed because that dream is at the core of our national identity. But it is absolute lunacy to turn to socialism Socialism is the economic model of countries people risk their lives to flee on makeshift rafts. When politics was between two sides that agreed that ours was an exceptional country, the stakes were different. But now our politics 
is between those who believe America is a great country, but with problems that need to be fixed, and those who believe America is a terrible country that needs to be demolished and rebuilt as something different. So look, the real fight isn't about the tax rate on billionaires because you can always come back and lower tax rates if they're too high. The real fight isn't even about the plan to spend 3.5 trillion or 1.75 trillion because two years of socialist policies may cost less up front, but it's still socialism. Here's the real fight. The real fight is about a small, radical, but incredibly powerful minority that wants to force everyone else to abandon a common sense that's built on 5,000 years of human history, to erase our culture and traditions, throw away our values, and walk away from a free enterprise economy that is still the envy of the world. That's the real fight. And the stakes couldn't be higher. Because if they succeed, the damage and the destruction it will cause will be nearly impossible to fix. And our country will be irreversibly transformed. And we, we're going to take our place in history as a generation that saw America become a once great nation in decline. And that will leave the world more dangerous and less free. Those are the stakes. That's why I'm so happy I'm, fine, I'm able to address you even though not in person, because it's that important. And I thank you for giving me the chance to address you today.